Well, welcome to worship here at St. Germain Evangelical Free Church. If you're new, I'm Pastor Josh. Thank you for tuning in. This is the 4th of July weekend, and so I hope you are celebrating that uh, and having a good time this weekend, staying cool up in the Northwoods. It is hot. If it gets over 85 in the Northwoods, we all start to melt up here, so pray for us. Um, this week is the first weekend in July, and so we're going to be having communion today on communion weekends. If you're watching at home, uh, you can participate just by getting uh, some bread or some crackers and some wine or some juice or even some water and having those elements available. We're going to do that after the sermon, at the end of the sermon today. Um, we want to let you know that we are continuing to gather outside on the weekend, 6 o'clock on Saturday night, 10 a.m. on Sunday morning. And we're going to continue to do that through to Labor Day weekend all summer. So you're welcome to come to that if you'd like. We are taking uh, some precautions as far as being safe and social distancing. And so if that's a thing that you want to be able to do and you're in the area, just know that that is uh, an opportunity. A giving is not, uh, we're not providing a, a space or a time to do that during our services. Uh, and so that's something that you have to intentionally pursue to worship the Lord through giving your tithes and offerings, either online or through the mail or in person when you're here. We have these little boxes that you can give. So we are grateful for the way that you continue to give and worship. And today we just want to gaze at the character of our Lord. And so that's our goal, that he is a promise keeper, our God. It's an awesome thing to realize. And so at the start of our worship service, receive this call to worship from Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love toward us and his faithfulness and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Let's worship.
worship now through time in God's word. And as we celebrate the 4th of July this weekend, it's fascinating for me to look back at our country's history to the time of the Revolutionary War and to see that our victory, our independence, hinged on a promise. Presently in the life of our country, 244 years after that very first 4th of July, it can kind of look to us like victory was a foregone conclusion, but it wasn't. We almost lost again and again and again. Just look at the history books and the accounts of, of Bunker Hill and Brooklyn Heights and Trenton. Uh, the accounts are harrowing. Arguably, victory for us as a nation was possible in large part because of a strategic bond, a promise between America and France. Initially, it was more of an informal relationship of support with some arms and some gunpowder, but then it became more formal when Benjamin Franklin went to France and representing America negotiated the Treaty of Alliance in 1778. 
And then it became more personal as they sent more than just equipment. France sent men. France ultimately fulfilled their promise in person. Uh, the story of French General Rochambeau arriving with more than 5,000 troops is stirring. Uh, General uh, Rochambeau didn't speak any English. General Washington didn't speak any French. But they clicked and they formed an effective team. And together they marched south to the siege of Yorktown and the ultimate surrender of British General Cornwallis in 1781. It was the fulfillment of a sequence of promises over years of working together. In the end, victory was only possible because of an alliance, a treaty, because of promises fulfilled between America and France. So with that as our backdrop today, I want to look at a different kind of alliance. One between God and his people. The Bible calls this a covenant. And like our country, there was not just one, but there was a sequence of them. Throughout the story of scripture, the accounts of these covenants are stirring. You could even argue they form the unifying thread of God's saving action through the Bible. And so today we're just going to look at how God is a covenant maker. Uh, we're in the beginning of a sermon series where we're looking at the different character traits of God and considering how that is an encouragement to us, how even his character can be reflected in the way that we live. And so today we're going to consider how God is a covenant maker. He's a promise keeper. And the bottom line for us today in the end is that victory is only possible in our lives because of an alliance, because of a promise, because of a covenant between God and his people. He made it. We broke it repeatedly. But he renewed it again and again and again. Thank the Lord he is a covenant maker and a promise keeper. That's our focus. So pray with me and then we're going to get going. Heavenly Father, as we consider who you are today in this weekend, on this 4th of July weekend, when we look back to uh, and remember, as we remember the Revolutionary War, I just pray that you would help us to see the kind of spiritual battle we may be in, uh, where, where your character makes all the difference in our lives, and help us to once again surrender to you. Help the scales to fall off our eyes. Help us to see you as clearly as we ever have before. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our victory and independence as a nation hinged on a promise fulfilled between America and France. So it is in our faith journeys. Our forgiveness and our transformation hinge on a promise fulfilled in Jesus. And what I want to do is just trace the sequence of five promises, five covenants between God and a number of representative individuals in Scripture that were ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. It means that I'm going to read briefly from like five different, primarily five different places in Scripture. It's going to be a brief review, but five covenants today. The first was with Noah. God made a promise with Noah. Uh, the first time the word covenant appears in the Bible is in the story of Noah. Uh, some theologians argue that there are three implied covenants prior to uh, this story of Noah, the covenant of redemption, the covenant of works, and the covenant of grace. But the first explicit mention of the word covenant in Scripture is in Genesis 6 and 9, when God promises with Noah. And so before the flood, God commands Noah to make the ark. He gives him directions uh, about the animals. And then in Genesis 6, 18, he tells him what he will do after the flood. He says, I will establish my covenant with you. And then after the flood, they come out of the boat. And in Genesis 9, God speaks. Listen to the actual words of this promise. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, 
I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on earth. God loves and values all life, human life in particular, And we begin right here to see that God's ultimate goal will encompass the whole of creation. We begin to hear that more and more throughout scripture. Uh, The beauty of creation, just looking outside, the beauty of creation is God's commitment to us. His commitment to not destroy it by a flood again at any point in the future is a powerful part of the way God interacts with us. And the way that he expresses his love to humanity. And it's one of our core values as a church. Time in creation. Just stepping outside of our door and being outside is a huge part of what it means to be in the North Woods and appreciate the North Woods and grow closer to the Lord. And we shouldn't pass by too quickly the fact that we are choosing to worship outside exclusively this summer. Uh, The choice doesn't come without a few challenges here and there. But I would argue that it brings us in touch with creation in a way that is powerfully stirring and draws us to worship. I was talking with somebody after the service just uh, uh, last weekend, and he's like, Josh, I I hate to tell you this. I wasn't distracted from uh, your message, but I really wasn't looking at you. I was watching that eagle up there. I was watching part of God's creation, and it was awesome. Um, Just this week, I... the other night I was inside our home and I was looking at my phone. It's maybe nine o'clock, nine fifteen at night, sitting in my chair inside, and uh, it died. The battery died, and just that kind of snapped me out of where I was. And I set the phone down, and I stood up, and I walked out our back door, and I walked down the hill of our backyard to our lake, and I got on our stand-up paddle bo- uh, board. And I paddled out into the middle of our lake and it was calm and the sun had gone down and the night was, the the sky was deepening and it's blue and there was a loon on the water and I needed to get snapped out of that moment to just appreciate creation, to be outside, to worship the Lord in response to seeing what he's made. God cherishes his people and he values creation and our place within it. He's committed to caring for this world, ultimately remaking this world when Christ returns. A new heavens and a new earth is our future home for all eternity. We hear all that a little bit in the promise of God to Noah. We can live inspired by creation because it reminds us of God's promise. That's the first covenant ever spoken in scripture, God's covenant with Noah. The second was with Abraham. God made a promise with Abraham. Only a couple chapters after the story of Noah in the book of Genesis comes Abram. Listen to Genesis 12, one to three. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. No explicit use of the word covenant yet, but this is a promise. 
God promised to bless Abraham, kind of like two promises, to bless Abraham and make him a large nation, but also to bless all people through Abraham. So Abram went as God led. He, he obeyed the Lord. God said, go, and he went. But he was getting older. It had been years since that initial promise. He had no kids. And so he began to fear the worst. And God spoke to Abram again. And he, he said this in Genesis 15, 1. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. And then he says in verse 5, he took him outside and said, look up at the sky. Get outside, Abram. Go outside with me right now. Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. And then God led Abram after that in Genesis 15 through a ceremony of commitment. And he formally established a covenant with him. Genesis 15, 18 says it clearly. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. And God would go on to renew that covenant with Abram. He would rename him Abraham in Genesis 17. And always with Abraham, there are two parts of the promise. I'm going to make you a, a great nation and make your name great. And I am going to bless all people through you. God's alliance with Abraham was, was really a commitment to the world. God is a promise maker. And he, he's always had a plan. He still does. We don't need to be afraid because God is in control. This should be fascinating and comforting for us to see how God has a plan. And to see how he fulfills his promises it really ought to stir us to surrender to him and kind of say, okay, Lord, I'm yours. I'm following you. Lead me. I trust you. We don't have to fear. I was reading recently a study about the fears of one particular age group these days, millennials, uh, those born between 1981 and 1996. By all metrics, they are the hardest hit segment of uh, People right now, by this recent recession, they tend to be waiting longer to make all kinds of commitments. And on top of that, they tend to be experiencing increased levels of fear. There was a study done by British Heart Foundation uh, that released the results of what some millennials fear. In this study, it shows that 37% of millennials uh, fear spiders. Others uh, other fears include phone running out of battery, 31%. Uh, fear of sending a text to the wrong person, 26%. Fear of having no Wi-Fi, 24%. Fear of deep water, 20%. Having my photo taken from a bad angle, 19% of millennials fear that. And we can kind of laugh at these fears a little, but the reality is that we all have different fears. Do a study on any one of the generations that we're a part of. We all have our fears unique to us. And we battle those fears because the world is a broken place, but God has a plan. God has a plan for everyone, not just for one segment of the world, not just for one people or one nation. He made a promise to Abraham to make him a great nation, but to bless all peoples. And God is a fulfiller of promises, which means we can live with confidence, unafraid of the unknown, because God is a fulfiller of promises. He has a plan. That's the second covenant, God's covenant with Abraham. The third was with Moses. God made a promise with Moses. Israel had grown into a nation like God promised, but they were enslaved as foreigners in Egypt. Through Moses, God liberated the people from that, uh, that oppression. And then on Mount Sinai, God met with Moses, who represented his people, and God formed an alliance with his people. That's when God established this next covenant. Exodus 34, 4 through 11. So Moses went up Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him, and he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. 
Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Moses bowed to the ground and at once worshiped. Lord, he said, if I have found favor in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. Then the Lord said, I am making a covenant with you. Before all your people, I will do wonders never before done in any nation in all the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. Obey what I command you today. I will drive out before you the Amorites, Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And then in verses 27 and 28, it goes on. Then the Lord said to Moses, write down these words, for in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. Moses was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights without eating bread or drinking water. And he wrote on the tablets, the words of the covenant. God made a covenant through Moses that Israel would be a treasured possession, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, that God would do miraculous and amazing things through this nation. Israel's requirement was simply to submit. It was to adhere to the commands that were given them at Mount Sinai. Uh, then Israel would be unique among other nations. They would reflect God's goodness and his direction to the people in the world around them. This was more than just the Ten Commandments. It includes the Ten Commandments, but it's more than just the Ten Commandments. This is the whole sacrificial system. This is all the regulations in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It was the beginning of people realizing in HD clarity that they needed forgiveness from God for their sin. They would fall and fail again and again and again. And there would be judgment, but there would also be grace. God would renew his covenant again and again and again. God made a promise that involved his people remembering and responding and obeying. I have this, uh, this ring that I got when uh, Wendy and I were in Israel just this last summer. And it has the first line of a Hebrew scripture on it, the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Ehad. It means, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And it's the beginning of a prayer that followers of the Lord have prayed for centuries, for millennia. And it reminds me, kind of when I hear that one line on this ring and I look at it on a, 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 on a regular basis, kind of in that one line is the culmination of our call to be distinct as we follow God. Uh, that we're to share that life with our children and to walk with them through life together and to pass on what God has given us. We're to never forget the way God stepped into history, loved us, forgave us, made promises with us again and again and again to be with us. The verse on this ring comes from the stipulations of the covenant that Moses enacted, that God enacted with Moses when Moses was the representative of the people that those people would be a kingdom of priests to the world, living out a relationship with God. We are called to live in obedience to God's commands because God's promise is good. That's the third covenant. The fourth was with David. So we got Noah, Abraham, 
Moses, and now David. God made a promise with David. Generations and generations after Moses, the shepherd boy David fulfilled prophecies by becoming Israel's king. And near the end of his life, after building himself a grand castle, he wanted to build God a temple. Which was nice of David, but God responded by saying, no thank you. Your son Solomon is going to do that for me after you've died. What I want to do with you, David, is to make a promise with you about something bigger than a physical building. Listen to 1 Chronicles 7, 10 to 14. This is God talking to David. I declare to you that the Lord will build a house for you. When your days are over and you go to be with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. I will never take my love away from him as I took it away from your predecessor. I will set him over my house and my kingdom forever. His throne will be established forever. And although the word covenant is not mentioned specifically here in 1 Chronicles 7, 10 to 14, we know this is a covenant because later that's what God himself calls it when he spoke with Solomon in 2 Chronicles 7. As for you, if you walk with me, if you walk before me faithfully as David your father did and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne as I covenanted with David your father when I said, you shall never fail to have a successor to rule over Israel. And here's the thing about these promises. They point beyond themselves to more. Like we can hear in the promise from God to David, when David says, I want to build you a house, God, and he says, no, David, but I will build you a house. When we hear that promise of God to David, we hear more than just physically what will happen. We hear in it physically what will happen. Like David's son Solomon will build the temple and that's what happened. But we also hear something greater than that. That there's going to be a descendant of David that will reign forever. It points beyond David. It points beyond Solomon. It points to Jesus. It points to more. Like, like God is the best parent in the world and there's a gift to come and he's giving us hints along the way. Uh, growing up, my, my dad and mom loved Christmas and giving gifts. It's hard for us to imagine Christmas right now because it's so hot out, but it, it will be here eventually. Uh, growing up, they loved Christmas and giving gifts. Everyone has a different way that they express love. Some express love through words, some through time, some through actions, some through touch, some through gifts. And my folks just love to give us gifts at Christmas and they would have fun dropping us hints the days and the weeks before Christmas, leading up to the day. And then only later when we opened the presents did we realize and kind of look back that they were pointing ahead to a future joy all along. In all of these covenants in Scripture, God has been pointing ahead to a future joy, to Christ. And we can hear it more and more clearly with each successive promise. It's the kind of thing that we don't fully realize um, is clearly when we first come to know Christ, when we first surrender our lives to Christ and we're walking with Christ, these kinds of arrows pointing forward in the Old Testament are a little bit lost on us. But we read scripture and we grow in our walk with the Lord and we mature a little bit more and, and we realize a little bit more fully that God has been dropping hints with us all along. I mean, from, from Genesis all the way through Noah and Abraham and Moses, and David, all pointing ahead. There's more to come, God is saying. We can always live with hope because God's promises always point to more. That's the fourth covenant. 
The last one, the fifth covenant that we're going to look at today is a new covenant through Christ. God fulfilled all his previous promises in Jesus. After falling again and again as a people to follow uh, God's ways, failing over and over and over again, Israel was defeated and they were taken into exile. And Jeremiah was a prophet during that time, during their years of exile. He was known as the weeping prophet because it was just a time of grief and sorrow. And within that time, uh, there is, however, this look forward to a new covenant. And Jeremiah mentions that in Jeremiah 31, 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, this Jeremiah 31, 31. When I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. This is just one place where this is promised that there will be a new covenant and that the Messiah will be the person that this new covenant will come through. Messiah in Hebrew means the promised one. This promised one will change the way this works from writing it on stone or on paper to it being written on our hearts. Hearts that will be changed as if from hearts of stone to hearts of flesh. And so for years, God's people waited and they struggled and they dealt with the consequences of their sin, but they were looking for the Messiah. And then finally, Jesus comes and we celebrate his arrival every Christmas. And this last Christmas, we read from Matthew 1.1 about the genealogy of Jesus. Matthew 1.1 says, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And we realize that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the promises of God. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. That's the whole story of the New Testament. In fact, the New Testament can be called the new covenant. We say the Old Testament and the New Testament, but we could translate it as well as the old covenant and the new covenant. According to the Gospels and the New Testament letters, the new covenant was confirmed through Jesus' death. In the very first ever Lord's Supper, Jesus points to the forgiveness promised in Jeremiah. And he alludes to the blood of the Passover lamb that was part of the covenant with Moses. This is a massive part of growing our walk with God, just seeing how God makes promises. We are in a world today of promise breakers. Our Lord is a promise keeper, and we can reflect that in the way that we live, and seeing it just, it, it, it brings awe for us as we worship the Lord. Seeing him as a promise keeper, seeing Jesus as the one who makes it personal, God's ancient covenant promises for Israel have been fulfilled in the church. And yet there is even more to come when all things are made right in the end. When God will reign with all his people forevermore. Ultimately, our inner peace and our forgiveness and our transformation from the inside out hinge on a promise fulfilled in Jesus. Victory is only possible in our lives because of an alliance because of a covenant, because of a promise between God and mankind. We can live in victory because God's promises have all been fulfilled in Jesus. That's the final covenant and the ultimate promise fulfilled. Five covenants, five pivotal promises fulfilled. Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, Jesus. On this 4th of July, 
We can look back and we can kind of acknowledge that our victory and our independence as a nation hinged on a sequence of promises that began with the Declaration of Independence. That was a promise made in Philadelphia in 1776. And then there was a treaty that as a representative, Benjamin Franklin negotiated uh, in France in 1778. Uh, and then that was fulfilled in person. And it led to this victory at Yorktown in 1781. Many people died along the way. Defeat was a hair's breadth away again and again and again, more often than we probably know. But we celebrate freedom today in large part because of a number of promises that were kept. And that's all important. It's important to look back and to remember that. I love celebrating that every year at this time. And I think we ought to know our history and, and it can be something that we, that we are proud of to an extent. And yet the importance of those promises pale in comparison with the covenants of our God and their fulfillment in Jesus. They pale in comparison. It can be stirring to look back, but they pale in comparison to the covenants that God made with us in Christ. Scripture teaches that we can live inspired by creation. And we're reminded of that with Noah. We can live with confidence. We don't have to be afraid. We're reminded of that with Abraham. We should live in obedience to God's ways. And we're reminded of that with the covenant that God made with Moses. And we can begin to live with more and more hope as we see the way that God's promise in his covenant with David pointed way beyond just his legacy. And finally, we can live in victory because God's promises have all been fulfilled in Jesus. And so on this weekend of celebrating freedom, may we as Christ followers remember, because our God is a covenant maker, a promise keeper, we can live with eternal freedom and hope. And so today we want to end our time with communion. We want to speak some of the words that Jesus spoke at that very first Lord's Supper and let them mean just a little bit more to us as we've considered the character of our God as a covenant maker. So worshiping online these days has made communion just a little bit of a challenge. If you would like to participate, feel free to sort of pause and arrange for the elements, that's what we are going to do right now. Well, let's continue on toward communion. If you've got those elements, bread or crackers or juice or wine or water, whatever it is, um, remember that it's the promise of God that we are remembering. And that is ultimately the most important thing we want to approach this all with a, a measure of reverence, but we want to look even past the elements to the actual promises that God fulfilled in Christ. So if you want to pass those out with any that you need to in your home right now, you can do that. And let's begin with the bread. Uh, the bread represents Christ's body. And at that first Lord's Supper, Jesus took the bread and it reminded God's people of earlier covenants and Jesus foreshadowed his own death on the cross by crucifixion when he broke the bread and then he gave it to his disciples. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 24, it reads, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. And then Jesus took the cup and he poured the wine. And that also reminded people 
God's people of earlier covenants. And in 1 Corinthians 11, 25 to 26, it says, In the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Take and drink. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are eternally grateful for your character as a promise maker. May we never forget that, Lord. And thank you for never forgetting us, for your love that never fails. Thank you for coming into this world and entering in. You are not unfamiliar with hurt. Thank you for the person of Jesus Christ for his death and his resurrection, for his great love for us. Lord, thank you. And now as we close in worship, I pray that we would just express back to you who you are in love and adoration and awe. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. without hope with no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested my life began ash was redeemed only beauty remains my orphan heart
thank you for gathering in this way and worshiping with us. Um, go into your week trusting the character of our God as a promise maker and a promise keeper. And hear this benediction from 1 Thessalonians 5. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Amen.